This is called Musar Sunday, and I'll explain what Musar is in a minute, but let me ask, does anybody know what Musar is? What does it mean? Yes, ma'am. Musar is like character traits, whether it be honesty, whether it be um, trustworthiness, there is the group of character traits that are part of Musar. Correct. Very good. So it is character traits. It's uh, building, building your character. And we have a lot of things we've been told throughout life. I'll do that. That'll build character, right? Uh, but there are some people, they go through the very same difficulty and they don't develop good character. It's bad character. You know, whether it's good or bad character, it's still character, right? And there are a lot of people that have bad character traits. And so one of the things that we'll do eventually is I'll have a list of about 400 character traits, good and bad, that you'll be able to take a look at and see. But for all practical purposes today will be uh, a, a basic introduction to Musar, where it comes from, what its purpose, and how do we work through it. Now, the, there is a Yiddish word that means mensch, or that says mensch. Have you ever heard that? He's a real mensch, right? Uh, a mensch is an overall good person. You know, just, a awful, just a, a really good person. And we come across people that are like real mensches. Like you just, they're just good people. You see them as patients that come in, people you deal with in regular week, business. And it, it's really refreshing to come across someone that's just a nice person. And they, it's not because they're like overly charismatic. You just can tell. They're, they immediately know how to communicate and connect at a very special level. Now look, there are other people though that may not have the great communication style. Maybe they're not extroverted, but they're still really a good person. And I can look at, around this room and all of all of our people in this class are really good mensches, okay? And it makes me feel good to be in this group. I mentioned this the other day in a class when I went to go buy this security camera for uh, for Nativ that's at the door. I was at uh, uh, help me Best Buy. Best Buy. Thank you very much. And while at Best Buy, I'm asking the, the clerk or the guy there, he says, hey, can I help you? I said, like, can you tell me about this camera? I'm looking at this Nest camera, et cetera. And he goes, uh, and he goes to tell me, and I hear this voice over my shoulder of a, of, of a boy, I don't know, 12, 11, 12. And he goes, uh, oh, his voice, best selection. Right? And I'm like, what? And he goes, best selection, best camera you could ever get. We have one in our foyer, and we have one in the living room. And he goes from describing how to do it, how to connect it up, take a picture of this, and put the app on your phone, bum, 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 bum. He says it's the clearest image you ever It even texts you when someone comes up in front of the camera, there's any movement. I was like, great. I said, and I asked him, I asked him a few questions, not the salesman. <laughs> and when it was over, I, I was like, okay, I'll take it. I'm, I'm sold. I'll buy it. And the kid started to walk up. I said, hold on, hold on. I said, what's your name? And he goes, my, my name is uh, Joshua. I mean, Jacob. And I said, hey, Jacob. And I told him my name. And I said, man, you sold me on this camera. You should get the commissions. And I walked off and I'm thinking, man, those parents made that boy a good match. <laughs> right? He's, he, was, he was articulate. He was not afraid to speak up. He was just overall good person. So what I'm hoping is in this class, everybody to include our young people, our young boys and girls and adults, that we all grow up to be good menches, good solid people. Toby. You mentioned it. <laughs> oh, you're being punny. That's a funny pun, right? Okay. I mentioned it. You are good. Excellent timing, Toby. I know, very good timing. Let's give them a drum roll. To do them. For well over a thousand years, the Musar teaching has been around. For centuries, Musar was providing illumination, illuminating approaches, and a highly practical set of teaching and, and practices cultivating in personal growth. Prior to the, quote, Musar uh, phenomenon, it wasn't very, um, it wasn't a focused thing in Judaism. Judaism was more concerned about the the integrity of text and the study of the words of the sages. Um, it was a very academic approach. And so what was missing in Judaism as, as a whole was this sort of introspection and personal improvement. And I would say probably at the time, and we have good evidence, that at that time when it started to grow, much of the Jewish community was like, ah, that's, that's, 
you know, psychobabble, that's, you know, that's stuff we don't want to mess with. That has nothing to do with real Judaism. But now it is a very central part of Judaism. And I would say that most people that have come out of other religions, there is an element of Musar in those religions, right? I would think most religions, too, I would even say probably in, in maybe uh, Islam, but just about every religion has elements of Musar, how to behave, uh, code of conduct. I mean, look, corporations have Musar. They have code of conducts in corporation. And if you don't follow through with it, you could get yourself fired for not following the company policy for code of conduct. So the idea is Musar is something very beautiful that we need in the world. There are countries that operate on negative character traits, and this is why they do not prosper. We can look at countries that are in poverty and yet have the greatest wealth resources available to them in their land and in the soil, and yet they still don't prosper, be prosper because their politicians are not operating with good character traits. The, the core of, the, of Musar is that our deepest essence is inherently pure and holy. Now let me examine this for a second. Many religious cultures try to point out that mankind, when I say mankind, I'm not being sexist, men and women, are at their essence sinful and impure. Judaism does not teach that. Judaism teaches that in the essence of the core of every human being, they have a pure soul that is not corrupted, and that that pure soul just needs an opportunity to elevate itself. So even a person with that may sit and maybe listen to the lecture go, uh, you, Rod, you don't know me. You don't know the stuff that I, ha I deal with in my personal character. And I, it's tough. But I want you to know that within inside of you is a pure soul that is, is really crying to become perfected. And this is what this is all about. Uh, this inner radiance is obscured by extremes of emotions, desire, and bad habits which veil the inner light. So if you think of it, think of the inner light of, in the Mishkan, the, the temple itself. That inner light that radiates out is covered by what? Skins? It's covered by, uh, by the atmosphere of the tabernacle, and people don't get to see those lights of the inner temple. And the same thing with us. Our inner light is often obscured by physicality. And what we're trying to do is, with good character traits, use that as a vehicle to allow that inner light to come out. That's why when you have good character traits, it, it becomes either a, a vehicle for light to, to shine out, or it, it creates a klipa. You remember the word klipa? A coating. And like, like an orange, you cannot know the taste of an orange until you pull the peel off. Not that I want to pull anybody's skin off, but the point is, is we want to have avenues in which our... our our, our light can shine through. Our task in life is to transform the veils and uncover the brilliant light of the soul. I want you to know, and everybody turn to somebody and say, I already have the good traits. Say it. Now, we all know. Okay, now everybody turn to the other person and go, I really know the truth, though. <laughs> I know you're working. All right, right, right. Yeah. So the whole point is this. We all have we all have the beauty of the of the good traits deep within inside of us. We just need to develop the mechanism that allows those good traits to come forward and the bad traits to go backwards. Now, the Musar masters developed a range of teachings and practices, some of which are contemplative some of which focus on how to relate to other people in a daily life, some concern, uh, some concern God to help them, uh, 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 us as heal and refine ourselves. A current Musar student put it well by saying this, quote, Each week I feel I am entering and spending time cleaning out the accumulated dust and grime covering my soul and mind. This is what's going to be exciting about this, is I'm hoping that from this point forward that, each one of us, to include from youngest to the oldest, that we go, it's time. It's time for me to, to quit being lazy about my, my life and my character and really refine myself to become a beautiful person. We talked about this in class, moving from age to sage. Now, none of us are sages in this room, as in old wise people. 
we're, we're just wise people. <laughs> hey, I'm trying to score some points here. You know, give me a break. I'm all I'm doing. So the whole point is that we were talking about uh, people that we've met that are elderly in, in like in care facilities and they're bitter and they're divisive and they're angry and they're violent and I'm wondering were they that way all their life or was that something that just came out when they got older but I'm thinking I don't want to be that person I want to be a person who's wise I want to be the person that everybody wants to come and talk to and communicate with and want to connect with how does that happen it happens by taking now starting right now we're not too old to start changing our inner character. We're going to begin with a brief overview of the most essential elements of Musar approaching to spiritual living after Toby <laughs> asked a question. What were you going to say? Mm. You don't want to physically rip someone's skin off, no. spiritually. Spiritually, very good. You want, to, you want to pull away physicality, very good. Now, one asks, well, where's the curriculum? We've had many of you say, well, what, what curriculum books are we going to use? And I'll suggest several books uh, in, in the end. Uh, and, and we already have gone through a couple, Derek Hashem, uh, The Way of God, uh, the other one is The Path to Just. These are fantastic Musar books. Uh, say again? Uh, no, I don't think that's a Musar book. So uh, we would say life, you know, life itself is actually going to be our curriculum. Okay, let me tell you why this is important. One of the greatest teachings of Brisla tells us that Hashem, Hashem, we need to look for Hashem in the cracks. Do you remember? You've heard that. So what does that mean? That means, for example, uh, quit trying to look for Hashem in a cherubim or a seraphim or an angel to appear before you or a voice from Shemaim, heavens, come down and speak to you. Look for Hashem when you're in Lowe's in the hardware store and someone comes up and says something and it either triggers something that causes you to go, I need to fix something inside of me, or it triggers something that you're inspired by what they have to say and walk away going, doggone it, that, that's a real mensch, that's a real good person, I want to be like that. What we're talking about is constantly through time, the Musar's masters have taught every one of us to assign a master uh, something in their life. You must have already begun to give in your assignment, you have already encountered it. Though you may not be aware that you are face, uh, what faces you is a curriculum, nor that it is a central task of life. Number one, let's look at the introduction. Your curriculum shows up most clearly in issues that repeatedly challenges you. You know what your curriculum is? Forget the books. What are the challenges that constantly plague you? Everybody's kind of chuckling to themselves because you know what I'm talking about. The challenges that constantly affect you, either between you and your wife, you and your co-workers, it's the same problem over and over and over. Parent and child, yes. Guardian? Siblings. Siblings, exactly. If you're constantly dealing with the same issue over and over, it's that Hashem has the page of that curriculum open and going, we're not moving to the next chapter until you fix this. Right? Now, what do we normally do with that problem? We don't, we don't look at life as the curriculum. We look at the fact that that other person is a problem, right? And if that other person would change, life would be so much better, right? Do what? I wouldn't have to change if you would change. As a matter of fact, I'm not the one that needs to change. You need to change. And if only you could read my curriculum book, you would change. The problem is, is, is even, and what's interesting, sometimes, and this is where we're going to get to the micro level down the road, but sometimes the issues between two people are, is not the real issue. Do you understand? The issues between two people, whether it's coworker, children, whatever, that's not the real issue. The issue is what you need to deal with and what that person needs to deal with. And sometimes they're totally two different things. One could be ego for the other. The other could be uh, 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 inferiority complexes, right, that have developed into neg negative character traits. An inferiority complex that is, turns negative is that, that you, you constantly uh, beat yourself up over everything. And if a person has an ego problem, on this side, what is, what is that person doing? It appears that he's constantly, yes, 
Yes. Right. They help you beat yourself up, all right? Right. Right? But the whole point is, is what I'm asking you to do is in this process over the next few months that you learn to step back and go, no, hold on a second. I need to look at this. What is it that I'm, I'm needing to learn in this curriculum? Everybody say to me, life is a curriculum. We cannot forget that, okay? You in school, remember. Something happens, your teacher says something to you, it makes you upset, go, life is a curriculum. Right? Alton, Dee Dee says something to you one day and it upsets you, instead of reacting, go, life is a curriculum, and then try to figure out what it is. A study book. Great, curriculum is a study book, very good. <laughs> It goes both ways. It absolutely goes both ways. It, it really does. Embedded within our personality, our personal history, I'm sorry, there is a curriculum. And the sooner you become familiar with your curriculum and get to work on it, the faster you'll be set free from habitual patterns. Did you get that? I'm going to say it again. Embedded within, when, within this personal history that we have, there is a curriculum. The sooner you become familiar with your curriculum and get to work on it, the faster you'll get free from these habitual patterns. So think about it. We all have a history, okay? We all have a history. If you think that the curriculum just starts today, you, you're missing out. You're missing out on a, an amazing prequel to your story. You need to go to it and look at it and go, okay, these are, this, is the, this has been the pattern of my life, right? This has been a pattern of my life. This is what's happened from the beginning. What can I learn from that and how can I change it? And to be honest with you, I'm going to tell you, my wife and I have been talking about this myself. I, I, as a 55-year-old man, I'm having to go, wow, okay, there, I need to look back. And not that we go back and live in the past. That's not what this is about. It's about taking the lessons of the past and saying, what is it I could, I, I should have learned that I didn't learn? That's huge. Just like, what should I have done that I didn't do? Yes, ma'am. Well, I was watching um, Facebook Live or something that Rob Moore did. I'm sure that people saw it. He was, you know, going down the driveway. It was uh, Friday, and his kids had all this stuff in the house. Did right. you see it? No. He had his kids had all this stuff. They were like having a garage sale, and they had all this candy out there. And he goes, wow. You guys took all my candy. What am I going to eat for Shabbos? And uh, if I, you take all my candy, you took all my. He was just like so. Cool. Right. And I thought I would have been like, oh, my get that in the house right now, right, right. Well. <laughs> and, and you're right, Rob Drawer is that way. But see, I would have been the guy on the video going, Oh, you have my candy, but Javis, turn off the camera, like, Get that candy back in that house. <laughs> Put them in their place, right? The reason why it's important to go to the past and do an evaluation up to present as a curriculum is you'll suffer less in the present. You, you follow me? What does it say if we don't learn history, we're, we're doomed to repeat history? Do we have to repeat history, really? No. No, God forbid. As a matter of fact, I, let's say this. We've learned from the sages of Judaism that a negative prophecy does not have to take place. So if a negative prophecy does not have to take place, well, doggone it, I don't have to repeat the same stupid thing that I've always done. That needs to change. How do I change it if I don't examine what I've done in the past? And also examine, you remember we talked about how interactions with, with people in life is part of the curriculum? Go back in life and say, what things happened in my past with other people that pointed to something that I've not been able to see? And then begin to meditate on how that needs to be reevaluated. Now, look at this. Then you will cause less suffering also to, here's the big one, not only less suffering for yourself, but less suffering for others. How is that? Come on, tell me. You know, you know, you, I want to see if you understand it. I have patience, I'm not going to be person. screaming at my kids. Right. If, you're, what, if you have patience, you won't be screaming at the children. What? You'll be a less abrasive person. Less abrasive person or whatever, whatever your negative trait that comes out. Right? Like if, for example, 
if, if someone always tell always is asking you are you are you okay are you are you are you okay if they're always asking you that know that you have a negative character trait that says that you're moody and maybe you're not even moody you understand maybe you have no sense of being moody but your countenance looks like it's annoyed do you understand what I'm saying oh you see you guys are laughing you know what I'm talking about right okay how now think about it. if you say of oh, use that as a curriculum right and you go you know what you're right I've been asked that my entire life and all of a sudden you begin to watch how your face looks you know measure how you present yourself and you notice that people quit saying that not only does it help you but it helps the other person because the other person doesn't feel tense or, or in anxiety around you and there are people especially at work you'll go to that it's like my, my dad used to have a saying that says you wouldn't be happy if you were born with a, a ruby in your navel navel have you heard that one before and at the time I was like no I wouldn't be because I don't even know what a ruby is <laughs> And I was thinking of some old Aunt Ruby. I didn't even know what that meant. Now look, every life has its challenges. And none of us are strangers to the ones that seem to be recurring f feature of our life. Though the experience you have dealing with those challenges, <clears throat> you grow as a person. Generally we do. E even if you're not cognizant of it, you'll grow at some level. Through the experiences you have dealing in these challenges uh, require you to begin to make choices. No one has a choice about that. You don't have a choice about the experiences. They are what they are. They happen. No use to, what's the word, cry over spilt milk? It is what it is. It's, it's a bad thing. How many times have you gone shopping and everything's great and somebody at the counter does something that really set you off that you find is rude and and you want to say something or deal something with it and maybe is nothing wrong. I, went, I as a matter of fact I went the other day to go exchange something and at the store when I get to the service counter uh, the woman behind the service counter didn't even acknowledge me and I'm standing back alone by myself standing back didn't acknowledge me she's just standing back there going chewing gum right and I just stood there well, trying to be respectful Finally went, you know, like this? And she's like, 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 what are you waiting on? So I show up. She doesn't say a word to me. Said, I'd like to exchange this. What do I do? And she's like, she went gum looking at me. Like I was, like I just fell off a turnip truck. And I said, do I go out and get the pants and come back? She goes, like, hello. Right? It was so, by the time I got back, I'm like, I'm going to tell the manager, no, no, no. Right? Because it was annoying. And I didn't go tell the manager and probably should have. But the point was, that annoyed me. Why did it annoy me? Because possibly I have some issues with, with needing to feel like I'm engaged as a human being and maybe respected. Right? At least a respect as a human being. Right? I'm not talking about her bowing down, an old great honorable one. Just be nice. That's all I expect. But I'm thinking, is that asking too? So I'm going through my mind. Is that asking too much that a person at least be professional behind the counter? And, and obviously I came to the termination. It, was, it wasn't asking too much. And I talked to somebody who was a manager of a store who said, no, you should, you should have called that in and said something about it. Because it helps the store. So there, there's the balances. You've got to find out, do I say something? Do I not say something? How do I deal with it? Um, why do we want Musar? Why is it important? Musar helps us to bring about what we call a tikkun olam. It brings about a repair to the world. If all of us are attempting to make a contribution to the world by changing ourselves, this is our own unique highest potential. I often hear people say, well, what, what does God want me to do? How, what am I supposed to do in life? Yet, what's my purpose in life? And it's not about you becoming a, mag, uh, a mechanic or a doctor or a physician. Whatever you want to be, you can be. But if you're not fulfilling your highest potential by developing your inter-character traits, it doesn't matter what you are. You're not contributing. 
right? There's somebody saw the news this morning where a man is videoed in the emergency room after playing basketball and has a severe, what they found out later was a panic attack. We didn't know, shortness of breath, all nine yards. And the doctor was absolutely over the top rude. Just rude, jerking his arm around and telling him there, there's, there's more sick people in this place than you. You need to get up out of here and nothing wrong with you. I'm just rude. Now, no matter how professional, how excellent this person is about what they do, they're not contributing at the highest level. Bedside manner. Bedside manner. Where you do have a choice, when we talked about we don't have a choice on things happening to you, where you do have a choice, however, is whether you let your curriculum play out in any way it will without preparing yourself through study and with guidance. Okay, you do have a choice. You can either say, ah, it's life. I'm not going to need to learn anything. If anything, everybody else needs to learn something and move on. Or you go, okay, what can I learn from this? Now, mind you, not everything that happens to you is a lesson. <clears throat> Some things just stupid things that happen. But if it can constantly comes up over and over, that's where you need to know it's part of your curriculum, right? Because we can't, you know, we say everything is by the hand of Hashem, right? Which it is. But at the same time, if it comes to you and you're not, and, and, and sometimes it's inconsequential. But is it worthy of a second look? Yes, it's worthy to ask. Is it possible that I have to deal with that? Here, here's the classic cases for people that are employed or works for a, a company. Uh, you get corrected by a boss, a supervisor, or whatever. And uh, your first defense would be do what? what do you, what's your first defense usually? Yeah. It does depend on your character. In, in general, as a human being without perfection of your character. Like give an excuse. Give an excuse. But you don't understand. But, 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 but. I, this happened. If this wouldn't have happened and that wouldn't have happened, I could have done this. So, so right, 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 exactly. It's, it's funny, I called about this, this unit and I actually talked to the tech that installed it. And poor guy, he was in Galveston trying to enjoy his day off. And I was like, hey, it's leaking. He goes, well, it, it's got to be the roof. And I went, yeah, it, it is the roof. And he said, well, it's not the air conditioner. I said, well, it's coming through the plenum. It has to be the air conditioner, right? Right, because he at first tried to excuse it. I said, no, I'm actually looking at it and it's actually coming through the, where the filter is. Oh, okay. But isn't it natural for us all to blank, say, start going, oh, no, no, I didn't do it. So the point would be is humility is a really important uh, trait that that's, that's needs to be done. But I don't believe that humility be, can be uh, gotten without a, a serious love and fear of God. Right? Now, the choice is in our hands to begin to say, I'm going, to, I'm going to make a difference and a change. The primary source for all Jewish thought and practice is what? The Torah. It acknowledges this very choice. Whether you grow by con con consensus, intent, or by blindly stumbling through life's experience. Deuteronomy 10.16 says, and we're told, You shall circumcise the foreskin of your heart. That image occurs only one other time in the Torah, Deuteronomy 30, verse 6. In the variant, and the Lord your God will circumcise your heart. Circumcision is a metaphor for the spiritual initiation, removing the obstacles to having an open, sensitive, inalienable inner life. In the first verse, we are offered the option to initiate it ourselves. In the second one, God says he would do it for you. Now, Toby, you were right when it says pulling away the spiritual skin, correct? So the point is this. It takes both. One, the initiation of a person that says, I need to take responsibility for myself. And the other is, is going to a shim and saying, I need help. Right? I am convinced, though, all the praying and hits by the dude that you could do out in the field will not fix anything if you're not willing to to make the first step to do it yourself, right? And that is the key. Now let's 
deal with this in, in the, in the uh, wrap-up of this first session. Too often people stumble after false answers to the questions posed by their curriculum. Here we go. Here's the first one. If only I was rich, I wouldn't have these problems. I could pay people to do this. I could pay a person to fix that. I could pay another person to make the beds, et cetera, et cetera. I wouldn't have to be annoyed at the kids because they have a messy house because I could have a housekeeper, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> What's wrong with that? Hey, back up. <laughs> okay. Right, 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 right. Now, look, nothing wrong with money, okay? I'm not saying, look, I would love, well, I don't need a housekeeper, but I, I'm telling you. <laughs> Boy, I got out of that one, didn't I? Notice how quick I retracted that. Yeah, my wife is an amazing housekeeper. <laughs> Boy, I need to move right along. Uh, now, I don't want to. I don't want to stomp on toes. I, I'm not trying to stomp toes, but it's not about you know. If if my hair could look different, if you know this could be better, if that, it's not about that. It's about first transforming the inner qualities. And this is the thing: can you change because of exterior things? Yeah, you can. Can I change my exterior look? Yes, I can lift weights, I can bodybuild, I can do all kinds of wonderful things. But all of those things really is not going to help perpetuate the most important thing, and as the light of divinity shining through. So. There are people out there that think, maybe I need to join a club, maybe I need to have this, maybe I need to buy an antique car. If that's what's motivating you think that your life could change and be better, it's not. Life changes because of the way you think, right? It's how you think. Those experiences do indeed cause us to have some temporary reprieve and growth. You can change things. You can go buy an antique car and fix it up and get some enjoyment out of it. Nothing wrong with that. But if you're doing that to, th to think that that's going to make internally make you a more content person and a more balanced person and a person that everybody likes to be around, it's not going to happen. It seems a pity, though, that entire lives are spent fumbling blindly in personal suffering at the cost to people around us in the world. When each of us has another choice, take steps to initiate in your own heart, that is what we are here to do in this Taste of Musar course by sharing teaches, teachings and practices from the way of Musar. Next week, or next time we come, we're going to talk about exactly what is Musar and its history of Musar. Where did it come from? What is purpose? But I'm hoping in this class that you will start, and this is one of the things I need to ask you to do. Uh, get, get something, a piece of paper, a notebook, and start making a journal of your thoughts and things that happen to you and things that need to be corrected. If you're constantly coming across the same things over and over, it's time to make a change. Do you guys want to change? I know I do. I want to change. I want to become a better person. And if the same, and young people, let me, let me just say this to you. If you're constantly being disciplined about the same issue and issue over and over with your guardian or your parent, the issue is you. You need to fix the issue. Okay? It's a character flaw. And I, I have often wondered, there are children right now in, in, in uh, detention centers who never had parents that could correct that character flaw. Why? Because their parents had character flaws that they just, they just it caused rebellion. Discipline without relationship brings rebellion. And so the issue is this. As a parent, we need to develop our character and our good traits. And at the same time, instead, sometimes, instead, especially after a child gets to a certain age, spanking them is not, is not worth it. It just doesn't work. Okay? After a certain age, you've got to sit down and go, this is a bad character trait. Let me tell you where this is going to lead you if you continue to operate on this character trait. Lying, whatever it may be, cheating, anger. You need to help them say, look, I need to tell you this, and this is why I cannot allow you to continue doing this. So we're going to work on fixing this character trait. Hopefully, God's will, in the next few months, we're going to be able to take this class and break down these character traits. My goal will be is to give you uh, the tools to look at your own personal curriculum 
and say, you know what, here are some ways I need to make changes. So my, my suggestion would be between now and next month, <coughs> between now and next month, start writing down and be honest with yourself, your good character traits and your bad ones. Can you think of some good character traits? What are good character traits? Yes. Huh? No, that that would go along with the ego one, which is not necessarily a bad. <laughs> yeah. Huh? Being polite. Being polite. That's a good one. Patience. Generous. Do what? Patience. Behaving. Behaving. Loyalty. Loyalty. Negative ones. Huh? Generous. Oh, that's a very important one. Kind. Huh? Friendly. Friendly. Yes, absolutely. Patience, yes. Yeah. Huh? Patience. Patience. How about, um, how about, um, uh, what's the word? You said friendly. It goes along with friendly. Um, well, we said generous. There was one other I'm thinking. Of. Yes, sir. Obedient. Oh, uh, yeah. You're really obedient to God. Yeah, that's, that sounds good. Yeah. Yeah. Did you have your hand up? Okay. Trustworthy. Trustworthy. Yes. How about, how about, uh, How's, how about faithfulness, being faithful, loyal, very important part. Somebody that you can trust. You know that if this person says this, they're going to do it. Doing nice things. Doing nice things. How about some bad character traits in our closing? Lying. Lying. Arrogant. A what? Arrogant. 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 Very good. Oh, that's really good. Deception. <laughs> Deception. Being a deceiver. Cheating. Yes. Cheating. Trying to kill somebody. Uh, well, that would, that's more than just bad, bad character. That's, that's a crime. That's what bad character traits lead up to. That's, yeah, that's what bad character traits lead to. Lying can be a crime. Lying can be a crime. Yes, it can be. Yes. What'd you say? Anger. Anger. Parting in people's faces. What? Stealing. Stealing, yes. Being a thief. Negativity. What? Negativity. Whoo, that's a big one. Excuses. So the opposite I'm of. Born this way, you know, just making excuses. Yeah, always making excuses, not taking personal responsibility. Selfishness. Selfishness, yes. Punching. What? No, no not punching. Depression. What? Depression. 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 Uh, it's, he says ungratefulness. It depends. I mean, I don't know. I mean, it depends. Ungratefulness. Ungrateful. Yes. Yes. How about Lashon Hara? Lashon yeah, yeah. Speaking evil, negative, all, all the time about other people. So, what if you're just joking? You're not supposed to. <laughs> Unless it's guys. Uh, my wife showed okay, me a... Good. Thank God. you got to give me something. My wife, my wife showed me something that was so true. It has a picture of uh, like five or six civilians. You're going to have to help me with this. And then five or six military guys. And this is a difference between civilian life and military. In civilian life, all of your friends talk good about you in front of your face and talk bad about you behind your back. In the military life, everybody, all your friends talk bad about you in front of your face and talk good about you behind your back, right? So, look, there, there is, I mean, there's a balance to it. Obviously, especially men get together and like to bust each other's chops and say things to it. And, and we all know it's in, uh, in hilarity. But we also have to be careful that we're not doing it for the purpose of tearing one down and building another up. I mean, I don't know, think that you guys do that, but... I think you, you could pretty much tell when somebody's trying to to hurt you. Yes, sir. Saying they did something really rude and then going and saying they're the best person in the world. Oh, yeah, like talking bad about them. Exactly. So that this is a, a, a basic start of the class. And I, didn't w I, I wanted to methodically go through this. I hope that you listen to each part of these elements. And, and really pay attention to the fact, and let's, let's just do a quick review. The fact that Musar is about character development and virtue development. Number two is that the real curriculum is not a book, but it's about your life. Because everybody's curriculum is going to be a little different, right? It's not just all set in stone. Number three, uh, that if we will carefully look at our life, not just the present and what happens, but in the past, we can begin to develop sort of the analytics to be able to make the proper change in the future. And last but not least, it's a very important part to not only change your life, but change the lives of people around you. That concludes this tour, and we'll be seeing you next time on Musar Sunday. Amen.